St. Lawrence. Uh, we have two miracles that we were talking about in 21 verses. Uh, Jesus uh, multiplying the loaves and fishes or feeding the 5,000. It's, it's uh, referred to both ways. And then Jesus uh, walking on water. There's a lot going on. Uh, in this passage, as there is in every single passage we've been talking about in John. So I'm going to try to just draw out a few things that, that may not totally have been obvious to you, and, and we'll see how I do on that. This uh, miracle, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, uh, I hope you caught on, and this was something that you saw. This is the only miracle that is reported in all four Gospels. A lot of the miracles of Jesus make it into three of the four but this is the only one that makes it into all four Gospels, which makes it awfully significant, and there are so many lessons that we can uh, learn from it. If it's the only miracle that all four Gospel writers thought they ought to include, that ought to give us a signal uh, that uh, it's an important thing. The narrative is uh, well known to you guys at this point. Uh, there's a little boy standing by. He's got a, a couple of little fish and uh, what, what John describes as five barley loaves. Uh, five barley loaves look something like this. Uh, and uh, we went, when we went to the Sea of Galilee, they trot you out to this little place where they serve you St. Peter's fish. It looks kind of like that. And you're, there's a picture of Frank Wagon and I holding little fish bones. Uh, up, and we were having a good time with it. So that's something like what Jesus had at his hands, that uh, picture. When we think of uh, five loaves of bread, don't, you know, don't think about the uh, bakery section at Central Market. Uh, think about something that's a little bit uh, more rustic than that. This is definitely a story of abundance. Uh, Jesus does a lot with just a little bit of an offering. And every time the gospel writers tell us the story, they tell it in that way. That there's this little boy standing by, and he offers his lunch, and Jesus, with this little bit of an offering, feeds the multitudes. It ought to say something to us about what a little bit of an offering to Jesus can do. right? What Jesus can work with. Jesus works with people with little faith. He works with people that offer him what little time they have, and he does something miraculous with it. And, and so when we're even willing to offer Jesus just a little bit of ourselves, we know that he can take that and he can make it into something that touches other people's lives. This little boy undoubtedly didn't think he was going to do something that would be recorded uh, throughout history. He was just standing by, and he was willing to share his lunch with uh with the Lord, and the Lord uh, miraculously uh, multiplies the loaves and fishes. It reminds me a little bit, and I wrote this note up here, of, of the mustard seed. You remember Jesus says, if you have faith even the size of a mustard seed, you could move mountains, right? So think about the implications of what, of what this message is in our own lives, you know? If, if we can offer Jesus even a little bit, you can do a whole lot with it. Uh, Jesus chooses to work with this little boy's offering. All right? He's very specifically working in all of the Gospels with what he is offered. All right? And so he, he invites us to be part of the blessing of others. Jesus wants us to offer. And sometimes if you're anything like me, you feel like, man, this is a pathetic little offering that I'm giving to Jesus. Kind of like this talk that I'm giving tonight. It's kind of like a pathetic little offering that I'm giving to Jesus. But you never know what he can do with it. Jesus does a lot with even just a little bit. So if you're a person who's like, hey, I don't know that I have that much to offer, then offer what little you think you can and watch what Jesus will do with it. All right? That's the first message of this story. Why are so many people gathered together? I mean, 5,000 people is a lot of people. When you consider that most villages during this time are like 300 people. So 5,000 people is quite a number of people gathered together in a small little area. So just a little geography lesson. Uh, this takes place right here. And Pavga is the name of the place. Right on the kind of northwest corner. 
if there is a corner uh, of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus spends almost all of his time in this area, all right, in his public ministry. When Jesus is doing cool stuff, his home base is in Capernaum, right there. That's where St. Peter's live. That's where St. Peter lives. And this happens just down the way. This was a common fishing spot for Jesus and his disciples. Uh, later in John's Gospel, the last story in John's Gospel, where the risen Lord appears to St. Peter, and we'll get there at some point, it may feel like it's a long way away. Uh, to some of you, it happens here uh, as well. So this is, I, I, when we were standing there, I asked the question, why are, you know, we're standing in this place, why are so many people uh, there when Jesus, why, is he, why are there 5,000 people to be like, that seems like a lot of people. This was a common rendezvous point, 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 common rendezvous point uh, for the Galileans. John makes sure to tell us that it's near Passover time. That's the time of year uh, that this uh, miracle takes place. And so what they would do is they would travel in caravans in big groups down to Jerusalem for the feast. And so it's very probable, and we know that this was a common meeting spot for them, so it's probable that they're all kind of gathering up and getting ready to go down in a big group. That's why there are so many of them. Jesus doesn't end up going with them, and you'll notice that from reading John's Gospel, uh, that he doesn't go to the Passover feast this year. He will go the following year, and that will be the uh, end of his life when he goes the following year. In chapter 7, he is going to go down to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. We'll get there uh, later, but he skips this one, and in John 7, 1, it tells us specifically that he didn't wish to go about in Judea because the Jews were looking for an opportunity to kill him. So Jesus is up here, there's a lot of people gathered, and he sees this as a time to feed this crowd uh, of people that are gathered. Uh, Let's just talk about numbers. So I hope we're seeing by now that there aren't accidents in John's Gospel. John is very specific about a whole lot of points. And every point that he's specific about, one of the things we can do is reflect or begin to reflect as we become, you know, kind of more advanced uh, Bible studiers. We can begin to reflect on what the details might mean. Is there another point that John is trying to get at? beyond just telling us a narrative about something that happened, all right? So we are starting to see that there's a spiritual meaning behind these, these little details, too. Five barley loaves, you know, the little boys got a little sack full of uh, five barley loaves. And when the church fathers read this, immediately two things uh, jump off the page at them. First of all, uh, five is the number of books in the Torah, or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, and that, that is commonly called the books of Moses or the books of the law. Sometimes you'll just hear those five books together called the law. Uh, and so what we know is that Jesus has to come to fulfill the law. He transforms the law by his presence and by his life uh, among us, right? Uh, and Jesus says this at one point in the Gospels. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, but I have come rather to fulfill it. The church fathers also see a real parallel to what Jesus is uh, doing to what the prophet Elisha did in 2 Kings chapter 4. Elisha takes 20 barley loaves, so it's very specifically barley loaves in 2 Kings, uh, and he feeds 100 people. And this is seen as miraculous, and there are some, some good leftovers uh, that uh, the writer of 2 Kings makes sure to tell us. You'll remember Elisha is the little buddy and number two guy of Elijah, and Elijah is, in the Jewish tradition, the great prophet, all right? The greatest prophet, right? So what we're reading is that what Jesus does here is even greater than what Elisha did. He multiplies five barley loaves and feeds 5,000, and we're reading that Jesus is the great prophet. Of course, the proof of that is the people, how do they react after they're fed? He is the great prophet. You know, he is the king. This is great. You know, 
He's our guide. He's only going to be their guide for a very brief time. All right, and next week we'll hear more about how uh, they hit the road pretty quick. There's two fish. Sometimes this gets interpreted as uh, two testaments. So again, all of this is revealing Jesus to us and the different aspects of who Jesus is uh, and, and what his ministry means among us. So, so he's, the, he's the fulfiller of the Old Testament law. He's the completion of the covenant. He's the completion of the prophets. He himself is the great prophet. He himself is the completion of God's word. Everything that God wants to say to us, we see in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh. There's 12 baskets full of broken pieces that they kind of collect after uh, mealtime is over. And this represents uh, Jesus completing uh, the, the covenant with the 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody remembers Jacob has 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are God's chosen people. And it's no mistake whatsoever that Jesus chooses 12 apostles, and they become that which, uh, which is the new Israel, or the church, right? So all of this points us to Jesus Christ as the complete and total fulfillment of all of God's promises in the Old Testament, all right? And that Jesus is, is a transitional and transformational figure in the history of God's people, all right? So Jesus is starting something new, and the church is usually referred to as the New Jerusalem, or sometimes the New Israel, uh, headed by the 12 apostles. In John 6.10, uh, there's a curious, another, like, like we're looking for details to kind of help us understand who Jesus is. We understand the overarching narrative but there's a whole bunch of details that are given to us that help us kind of understand even further who Jesus is. Uh, and, and I don't know if you caught it, but in all of the tellings of the story of the feeding of the 5,000, there's a little boy. He offers his bread and his fish. And in every one of them, it's very specific that the people are asked to either sit down or, John says, recline in the grass. Uh, that there was a great deal of grass in that place. And I hope what you uh, caught on to, and there was a question about it in the notes, uh, and I hoped it wasn't uh, such a random question that nobody would catch on to it. I don't know. Uh, you, I guess you can tell me afterwards if you did or didn't. Um, but uh, in Psalm 23, it talks about the Lord is my shepherd and that he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Right? So he makes the people recline in the grass, and in this way, uh, the, the, the good shepherd is leading his flock, beginning to lead those who will follow him into uh, the pastures. And of course, we're fast forwarding a little bit here on this last note, a few chapters ahead. John chapter 10 is Jesus' reflection on how he is the fulfillment, of course, of Psalm 23, but we begin to see that just a little bit here. Did anybody catch on to that in the notes, or was that a, was that a good question? <laughs> Did you have that question in your packet? <laughs> yes, yes, and he, he feeds his people. I want to just point out something that uh, that is um, consistent in every telling of the story, and I want to link it to some other telling of another story. So in all four tellings of the story, Jesus does something virtually, uh, the way that the gospel writers describe it is, is virtually identical. It's very similar, the description that takes place as Jesus is kind of gearing up for the miracle. In every one of them, he takes what is offered to him, he gives thanks for it, uh, he breaks it and he gives it to the disciples to distribute it to the crowd. All right. So, so in this, we're reading about sort of four key things that he takes it, he gives thanks for it, he breaks it, and he gives it. And this is the exact same terminology that is used uh, by the four gospel or by the four accounts of the Last Supper. 
when Jesus institutes the Eucharist, that he takes what is offered, he gives thanks for it, or blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. All right? So what we're seeing is the gospel writers are telling us the story of the feeding of the 5,000, but they're using very similar language to describe Jesus' actions when he institutes the Eucharist. So when we read about the feeding of the 5,000, we read about people being uh, miraculously and abundantly fed at the hands of Jesus, and then we read about Jesus at the Last Supper uh, doing a very similar action, the same action, by the way, that he also does when he uh, uh, gets off of the road to Emmaus with the disciples he's traveling with, uh, then we are reading that there are some, some subtle connections being drawn between these two events, the feeding of the 5,000 and the institution of the Eucharist. Because if you think about it, what we're, what we're talking about, what we're thinking about, is Jesus feeding his people. He's going to explain that he's going to feed them with the bread of life later on in chapter 6, next week's lesson, uh, which is his flesh and which is his blood. All right. So Jesus is feeding his people uh, with, with his own life uh, miraculously, and there's a deep connection just in the terminology that's used between uh, the Eucharist, uh, the institution of the Eucharist, and the feeding of 5,000. Sometimes that's called the fourfold action of the Eucharist. And if you uh, think about the way we do it here at St. Lawrence, right, there's an offering that's brought forward, right, like one of the couples each week's kind of, you know, the ushers kind of tap them and they bring forward the bread and the wine. We take it, we put it on the altar, we give thanks. That's what the word Eucharist means in Greek, to give thanks. Uh, and, and there's a prayer uh, that's called the Great Thanksgiving. Uh, so we give thanks, uh, we break it, right? The breaking of the bread, uh, and then the giving of it to God's people for their nourishment, right? Is it head, uh, when we are fed in church, we're not fed, we don't think, at the priest's hands, but we think we are fed at the hands of Jesus. All right? That is, Jesus who continues to minister uh, and feed us as we do these things. So the fourfold action of the Eucharist, <clears throat> connected to the feeding of the 5,000. Very similar descriptions. After uh, everybody's bellies are full and that whole thing kind of wraps up a little bit, uh, the disciples head out on their boat. We read that they're heading to Capernaum. Uh, and I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. So Capernaum again is just right here. So they're just, they're just heading up the way a little bit. And we read that they get out maybe three or four miles are out there a little way out on the sea and some storms start uh, kicking up. John notes as he tells the story that it's kind of the end of the day. The sun's going down and he notes in John uh, 6, 17, it was now dark uh, and Jesus had not yet come out to them. Remember one of John's favorite themes is light and dark. And he believes that the world is in darkness, and it is very, very clear from the very beginning, and, and that Jesus Christ is the light that shines in the darkness, right? The light shines in the darkness, he says, in the prologue, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so St. Augustine picks up on that, and he says, hey, absolutely, uh, it was dark out there because Jesus has not yet come. When we think of what's happening here, we can think of a group of 12 guys are out there, and there's a big storm that's kicked up, and Jesus is going to come out there and help them out. There is that element of what's happening here. But there's also some spiritual meaning to what's happening here. There's some symbolism that's going on here. There's, there's, a, there's a deeper understanding that is at work in this event, and, and it's not so much Jesus about Jesus walking on water, it's about what his presence means and what his absence means. 
right? Because things are going bad in this boat before Jesus shows up. But once Jesus is there, then immediately they arrive safely uh, to where they're going. Sometimes the church is called, and maybe you've heard it called this before, the Ark of Salvation. Noah's Ark is an early uh, type or a foreshadowing of the church. That ought to tell us something, right? Because Noah's Ark is full of dirty, smelly animals. Uh, and so the church is full of all kinds of dirty, stinky people uh, who, are, who are themselves being saved by God. Uh, and so in this, these disciples, who are the church at this point, uh, they are the followers of Jesus, and they get in this boat, and without Jesus, they're in trouble, but as soon as Jesus is with them, immediately they arrive at their destination. Everything is fine with Jesus. Sometimes you'll hear the church building called the nave. I don't know if you've heard that terminology before. Uh, the nave comes from the same word as navy, so there's this, uh, this it's connected to this idea of, of the ark, the boat of salvation. In fact, a lot of churches, um, uh, in older churches, you'll kind of look up and it's designed, the top of it is designed in a way that kind of looks like the bottom of a boat, like an upside down boat, you might say. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Probably could have shown like, you know, 400 pictures of it. That would help. Uh, but so it's all on this imagery. Um, and so something we want to learn from this uh, is that e even in the midst of storms, if Christ is with us, we're in the best place we could be, right? We e even, uh, even, but without him, uh, we're in serious, serious trouble. Um, and anytime we, we uh, are outside of his presence, uh, we, are, we are in peril. And so if we try to do it without Christ, uh, um, we, are, we are absolutely doomed. So Jesus is always at the center of the church's life. And anytime the church gets itself in trouble, we read about scandals and all that, it's of course when the church has, has knowingly uh, uh, made some decisions to move away from the word of God, the eternal word, Jesus Christ. So in this, we're reading about, yeah, there's 12 guys. Jesus walks to them on the water. Uh, <laughs> He, he goes and he, he brings them uh, safely ashore. But we're reading about something far, far deeper and something that we can learn, too. Uh, that anytime we try to go alone, uh, anytime we're out there kind of by ourselves, uh, we want to make sure uh, that we look to Jesus. Because uh, if we are with Jesus, even if we are in the midst of a storm, we're in the best place we could be. So it doesn't, and the other thing I might say on that, the storm came, right? Like, so if Jesus promises us that the storms are going to come to our lives too, right? I mean, there's that whole thing where he says uh, some people build their houses on the sand and other people build their houses on the rock. And then he says, and the storms come to both and the people whose house is built on the sand, you know, it's gone. But the people who build their house on the rock, it uh, withstands the storm. The storms are going to come, right? So everybody's going to experience lows and bad times. There's no promise in the gospel that it's all great moments along the way. Anytime you hear a version of the gospel that says something like that, you ought to be a little disconcerted, at least, to say the least. Uh, the storms are going to come. And if Christ is there with us, that's the best place for us he'll bring us safely to our destination. The last thing I want to say is uh, what Jesus says when he arrives, and it's significant. Uh, it may, maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. Uh, it is, I do not be afraid. So two very brief sentences that say a ton about what he's there to do and who he is. This ego, I, me, is the Greek uh, version of it is I, and you can also translate it as I am. And that ought to remind us uh, 
of the interaction that Moses has with God, and God is commissioning Moses, and Moses says, hey, listen, you know, these people down here, I'm going to go talk to them, and they're going to ask me what your name is. What should I tell them your name is? And of course, what does God say back to Moses? I am. Tell them I am sent you. When Jesus arrives, he has clearly shown his uh, authority over nature. He's walked on water out to them maybe a couple miles, right? Like he is, he is miraculously showing his authority over nature. And then he says this name, in Greek it's ego I mean, in, in, in uh, Hebrew it's Yahweh. Uh, that's what I, I am translates to, and if you read Yahweh in your Bible, that's from that name that God gave to Moses, the holy name that no one ever would utter. So we're about to start transitioning into a lot of the I am statements in John's Gospel. And what we need to know as we start reading these I am statements is that there is a, a, a scandal around them because this is not a word that ever gets spoken. So like the little guy in church who's like the reader that Sunday, he's the you know, the lay reader, he's the Mike Brassic that Sunday, and he stands up to read the thing. Like, when you get to this word, wow, they have some, some haters. <laughs> you do a nice job reading, Mike. Uh, you skip that word, all right? You don't say that word out loud, Yahweh. And so when Jesus shows up to pronounce it, he is... He, Oh, I think that means my time's up. Uh, he, he is, uh, he's, he's equating himself uh, with God. He's uttering the holy name. I am here. Of course, he says, do not be afraid. And do not be afraid is, uh, and maybe you've heard this before, it's a common reading throughout the Bible. Uh, Pope John Paul II said there are 365 times that phrase occurs in the Bible. Do not be afraid, one for every day of the year. Do not be afraid, because in the presence of Jesus, we're in the right place. So this is a reflection on the law being given through Moses and grace and truth coming through Jesus Christ, and that he is the very presence of God himself, who has come among his people, and when we are in his presence, uh, we are in the best place we could be, we're in the right place. And even if it's in the middle of peril, and even if it's in the middle of a storm, Christian person believes that in Christ's presence, uh, we are in the best place we can be. There are packets here. I'm going to ask you to stand up. We're going to say a prayer, and then we'll wrap up the Bible study uh, next.